Um, so Bruce Bork currently directs the Mary Meeting Bay Pioneer Project, which is founded by Bruce and Fred Kerber, Alan Bowes, and Chris Gutcher. From 1970 to 2001, uh, Bruce directed the Fox Islands Archaeology uh, Project, uh, which included the, um, the goals included the reconstruction of prehistoric, cultural, and environmental history of the Penobscot Bay region. And then from 1975 to 2015, uh, Bruce was director of the Mary Meeting Bay Archaeological Project, which sought to assess the impact upon prehistoric human populations of sea level rise in our very own Mary Meeting Bay area, uh, including a lot of extensive investigations uh, at a number of large archaeology sites uh, spanning most of the Holocene era. And a lot of those were in Topson. Um, <clears throat> Bruce has published a number of journal articles over the years including the archaic period of the Mary Meeting Bay region, um, co-written with Steve Cox and, and Bob Lewis. And uh, his most recent popular book, which is really good, published in 2012, is The Swordfish Hunters, History and Ecology of an Ancient American Sea People. Uh, Bruce holds a BA from University of Massachusetts, um, MA from University of Colorado, and a doctorate from Harvard, all in anthropology. Fred, who was going to be on the program as well, a senior educator in Brunswick, also an experienced avocational archaeologist, and he organized the excavation of the Robert Jordan House, which was 1639 to 1675 in Brunswick, using crews composed mainly of high school students. Fred's also been involved in excavations at the William Woodside site, the James Matthew Thornton site, the Jeff Scott Proprietors McCoy House site, which was a fortified garrison. And over the years, Fred's been a really, really wonderful volunteer of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, uh, often at our Bay Days um, as a volunteer teaching hands-on archaeology to area school kids. So with that, I'll turn this over to um, Fred and, and Bruce, and I think Bruce is coming up first. Thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, happy to do it. So I think I'll begin by letting you know how this project came about. Um, and outlined my kind of research history. I did about 35 years of prehistoric research around Mary Meeting Bay. I was fortunate to have students, energetic young students from Bates College where I taught uh, to uh, do a lot of digging for us. And during that period, I was in touch with folks who were doing historic archeological research. Mine was completely prehistorical. And uh, they kept asking me, did you happen to run into any early colonial artifacts? And I, I had to keep saying no. And eventually they, they went off to other projects. And I came to the end of my prehistoric interest in the Bay. We had done a, what I wanted to do, a couple of things. I wanted to build a cultural chronology because you know people should understand that it isn't just plain Indians all the way down. The, the, these cultures came and went for reasons we don't fully understand, but they did, they came, they went, replaced by other people who lived differently. So we had to build a cultural chronology. And uh, then we had to understand why they were in the Bay. Most people in the Holocene, the Holocene is the end of the Ice Age to the present. And most indigenous people here uh, tended to hang toward the coast. Uh, that's where most of the resources were. They visited the interior for specific purposes. And we, we decided that uh, they, they came to Mary Meany Bay area to catch fish. No surprise. Fish was a major resource for all of them. And we looked at sites all around the bay and determined that they uh, were various kinds of fishing locations that uh, tended to move upstream over time because the sea level was rising, as Ed noted. And uh, as one foot, they tended to, to fish at falls where fish would gather before trying to get over the next falls or riffles. And as the sea level rose, they'd abandon that site and move farther up. So we, we did that for 35 years. Then I decided to retire. And by that point I had good friends, uh, those uh, among them, those who joined the project. And we decided, well, let's go answer those historic archeological questions because no one else was looking into it at the time. And we were very fortunate to uh, come upon the Mary Meeting Bay Trust, which has been a tremendous supporter of ours. 
and we have been supported by them for the last four years. And so we set about trying to locate these sites, at least half the researchers archival. What really triggered it for me was finding a list of settlers uh, in papers of the Maine Historical Society, the Pajeps Good Proprietors Papers, Collection 61, I think. And I found a list of, uh, well, let me explain. The Pajeps Good Proprietors bought out the deeds to all the settlers who'd been here before King Philip's War and were driven out by the war. The Pajeps Good Proprietors intended to reorganize the territory and to resettle the area. They were real estate developers. And in the, pro in the course of trying to document their activities, they made a list of uh, all the people who, from whom they had purchased deeds. And we found a list that listed uh, in order from the downriver from the falls, let's put it that way, who had bought property around the bay. And so we used that uh, as a beginning for our explorations. And we were fortunate, really fortunate to have the cooperation of the Hunter family, who are a beautiful piece of property in Thompson. And it turned out that the, the descriptions of where most of the settlers, or many of the settlers lived, fell on the Hunter farm or, or a little farther down on stream. So we, we've been working pretty diligently and we'll learn more about the archeological aspects later. Uh, and Fred, will, Fred is the master of uh, understanding local history and he will fill you in on the details of all that. But my other area of speciality is uh, indigenous peoples, both prehistoric and historic. And I think it would be useful for me to sketch my understanding of what indigenous life was like just before the settlers came, pioneers came to Mary Meeting Bay. That's a more complex story than you might imagine. European influence came into the area in the late 1500s. Um, not directly. Uh, Europeans began to fish uh, and hunt for whales in uh, the St. Lawrence estuary. And in doing that, they came into contact with natives, began the fur trade. And you have to understand the tremendous impact that European manufactured goods had on the indigenous people. Manufacturing, as Europeans developed it, created things that indigenous people just had, couldn't even conceive of. The most important was cloth, fabric, textiles. Beyond that was metal tools. And what the Europeans offered was the exchange of those materials for something that seems a little bizarre now, but uh, beaver pelts, mostly beaver pelts, furs in general, some ornamental furs, but those are kind of going out of style in Europe by 1880. Uh, but instead, the beaver hat, the typical pilgrim hat, had taken over its beaver felt, the high quality ones, beaver felt. And so there was an immense demand for beaver, which the indigenous people were happy to supply uh, in exchange for European goods. So this, this began in the late 18th century, uh, late uh, 16th century, 1500s. And uh, indigenous people all down the coast, at least as far as Massachusetts, got into the game early. And they got into it by dealing with indigenous people who had contact with the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And they uh, went into business as middlemen. They either stole European boats left over for the next season. These would be small boats, shallops up to maybe 40 feet. Or they went into partnership with the Europeans. Uh, we'll give you the boat, you will get the furs, and we'll trade here for metal uh, for European goods next, next spring when we arrive. And so that introduced the shall we say, the taste or the interest in European manufactured goods it was well established by 1600. But Europeans themselves didn't arrive in the Gulf of Maine area much before, oh, 1610. And when they did, they found native population in complex relationships with their neighbors all throughout the Northeast. So it's a, it's a mistake, I think, to think that they found a bunch of happy Indians living indigenous lives who never who didn't understand by Europeans. As a matter of fact, some of the first indigenous people encountered by Weymouth and some of the other early arrivals met in, and these were people who'd, who'd been to Europe. There was one who'd been uh, trained in military tactics, 
by the mayor of Bayonne. These are these are sophisticated people, but they 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 had the arrival of European influence had created stresses among all the indigenous groups from here to oh Montreal, and so when Europeans arrived, they found people who actually wanted their close contacts with them to obtain material goods. And that was in the context of exchange for furs for material goods, uh, manufactured goods. But also they wanted allies against their indigenous uh, foes, enemies. And so it was not a hostile situation. And we don't want to emphasize King Philip's war in this presentation because King Philip's war was uh, the end to a first episode of colonization. And it was not a hostile relationship. And of course, Fred will deal with uh, the uh, stresses among co colonists. Uh, you know, this was the eastern frontier of English colonization. So they had stresses from the French uh, to the south. They had stresses from the Dutch. Uh, and so this was not a, a, this was an economically productive encounter, but it was not a peaceful, happy, idyllic one. You know, these people worked with each other. They did the best they could get along. Keep in mind, uh, when, when trouble broke out, when people acted badly, cheated each other, and so forth, there was no police force to call. There was no government. They had to sort out their relationships on their own. And so by the time 1675 came around, mostly influences from the outside had put so much stress on these people that uh, war broke out. So that's, that's my way of trying to introduce uh, what was going on when the first colonists arrived in Murray Meeting Bay. And I'll hand it over to Fred from there. Just say, I'm not hearing anything at the moment. There we go. Is my screen up? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Good. Um, well, you know, starting out, it's it's a fascinating story and it's far more complex than um, you know, first blush. One of the interesting things about the project that we're engaged in is that we we've found that a lot of people in approaching the history of the bay have done it on a very uh, topical kind of uh, approach where it, it may have something to do with um, economics or politics or genealogy or conflict. Um, and, and our approach was trying to get the, uh, connect all of the pieces together so that there was a, uh, uh, a clear vision of uh, a better understanding of how the pieces fit together. And emerging from this, and, and you know, our work is ongoing, emerging from this is a really fascinating picture um, dealing with the relationship of the first settlers and uh, the indigenous community around the Bay. Um, and if I can just, there we go. So um, th this sketch here um, uh, illustrates uh, something that, uh, if I can get my tools up, um, illustrates, there we go, um, that, you know, here we have, uh, this is from the Johnson map, 1755. It's a little bit later, but um, uh, it, it serves a purpose. So when we take a look at the bay um, uh, right here, we really find that this is a hub. And, and I know ecologically, a lot of the work that uh, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay have done, they, they've talked about this great mixing zone. Um, but actually, um, when it comes to the history of the people, it's also a great mixing zone. And from, uh, uh, you know, the Andrew Scoggin uh, coming down, um, from the Kennebec coming down, um, this right here would be uh, the area of Taconic around uh, uh, the area of uh, uh, Winslow. Uh, this was a carry over to the Penobscot. 
Um, we have this gateway into the bay here through the uh, uh, Sassanoa. Um, and, and that allowed a lot of traffic uh, to move east-west along the, the coast. But, but this is really the hub. Um, it's, it, it is a mixing area for a lot of these, um, a, a lot of these communities. Now, some of the interesting things that we've uncovered here, and I'm pausing because my computer seems to be a little bit lazy. And um, let's see if I, there we go. One of the things that we found uh, regarding the early settlers, um, there are some patterns that are starting to emerge. And if I could just explain this, um, this is a site we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, this is over in Topsom on the Foreside Road. And um, um, it is a very interesting site. It is unnamed at this particular point, but we know it's early. It's earth fast construction, uh, very thin material culture. Um, it was small, um, but sturdy. And um, the green that you see here is looking across uh, the, the vista, across the bay. And over here is the site of Thomas Stevens. And what we're finding is that a lot of these folks are living um, anywhere from two miles uh, to a half a mile away. But uh, the sites that they're choosing, uh, we can identify the necessary things in terms of fresh water and access to um, the bay and the rivers um, and, and other items. But the one that we're uncovering that's really unique is there seems to be a connection by view shed. And um, within location of one individual, um, it seems to be a pattern where they can view other people who may actually be some distance away. And one of the things that we need to be aware of um, on the frontier here is that these people um, live in a very remote setting, but they are not isolated. And, um, you know, whether we're dealing with indigenous people or whether we're dealing with settlers in the early phases or the later phases of our study, news is traveling and um, it travels fast and people react to it. So we shouldn't think of them as being um, in some sort of backwater setting where they're isolated from the rest of the world. Okay, our first settler into the area is Thomas Purchase. And he first comes here, we're not exactly sure, but um, we know he's here at least by 1628. He does not have title to the land, however. He receives title to the land um, in 1632 from the Council for New England. And I'll talk a little bit more about that group in just a bit. But this would be the approximate area of his holdings according to the grant that he received from the Council for New England. And, um, you know, it, it's um, a little bit up the, the Andrew Scoggin from the Bay, but the Bay is a very important byway. And he is here to trade. And we, we find that there's also an emerging pattern that the very earliest settlers are looking to trade primarily. We're gonna find that later there's a shift to trading and fishing. And um, at the, towards the uh, beginning of King Philip's War, we're gonna find that it, trading is still important. There is fishing, but there is agriculture where they're actually, um, uh, it, it, it may be, um, you, you know, animals, it, it may be crops, they're shipping those out. So um, they're, they're producing products for market. 
Um, but that seems to be the sequence uh, that's common for a lot of these early settlers. So Purchase is here and he's going to be a primary player as time moves on and his holdings will expand. Um, I just need to talk a little bit about um, one of the competing three power groups that are gonna be involved in creating chaos around the Bay. And it is the Council for New England under the leadership of Ferdinando Gorges. And the um, uh, Council for New England was established um, as a uh, granting agency on behalf of the king. And the vision for Gorges and um, the members of the uh, Council for New England was that these would be large manorial holdings um, where there would be an estate managed by uh, someone like a lord. And then the people coming in would be tenants on the land. So that is the vision initially that was framed out for early Northern New England. And uh, uh, the role that Gorges saw for himself was, I will be the supervisor of all of these um, you know, estates. And these are large landholders. And um, we're gonna find that this shifts several times. There are political issues in England, um, with uh, you know controversy around Charles the first and some of um, his engagements in uh, in in warfare, um, and then we have um, the uh, interregnum where Charles is um, beheaded, and the Puritans take over for ten years, and then the Restoration. So the fortunes and the strength of Gorges and his uh, buddies in the Council for New England sort of wax and wane over time. There we go. Well, into this area, we have Purchase and we understand what um, he believes is gonna happen. He's gonna have a large estate. Um, and just framing that out, <clears throat> it appears to be about 17,000 acres. Um, it's not clearly defined in um, the grant. Um, and what we find with a lot of these grants is they overlap. Um, the mapping is not precise. We, we find that some grants are issued and, um, and then not acted upon and secondary grants are issued in the same area. But I want to turn our attention to this area up here, the Plymouth claim. <clears throat> when the, when the uh, folks that we call pilgrims landed in Plymouth, they arrived with a huge debt. Um, it, it was a great burden. And we know they struggle in the beginning just, just to survive. In 1625, uh, Winslow will make a trip up here. There's an excess of corn in, uh, in Plymouth and he travels um, up the Kennebec and establishes um, some trading relations with Indians on the upper Kennebec. He returns from that 1625 trip with 700 pounds, that's weight, of beaver pelts. And immediately, people in Plymouth realize, wow, there is opportunity here. Now, um, Plymouth uh, settled, when they settled on Cape Cod, they did not have good title to the land that they settled upon. They were given a temporary grant. And if they managed that for a period of time, they could come back to the Council for New England and apply for a permanent grant. In um, 1629, they do that. And um, uh, Isaac uh, Allerton will uh, 
negotiate that on behalf of Plymouth. And um, he gets the, the title for the Plymouth uh, colony proper and also for land on the Kenny Beck. And that land would have been uh, approximately in this area, would have been about uh, today, halfway between um, Waterville and Winslow and just above Kaba Sakani. Um, and it extended 15 miles um, east and west from the shoreline. And the idea for, for the uh, folks at Plymouth is that this is where they're going to establish uh, fish uh, trading stations. And um, as a matter of fact, they actually initiated that one year before they got clear title. Well, um, let's go back. This is the this is Mary Meeting Bay. Um, here is the Lower Kennebec Sagata Hawk. Um, and this right here is the corner of um, Thomas Purchase Holding. And this is an important vision for us because of uh, uh, view, because what will happen over time is Purchase will claim, and it is acknowledged by Plymouth by Massachusetts Bay and by the heirs of Gorges as being valid. He will sign a number of Indian deeds that run along the entire south shore of the bay up to the chops. Down to Kennebec, um, as far at least as um, Wigby and maybe down to Winnegans. This island right here, which is today called Line Island, had been called Linda Island, was originally Purchase's Island. So um, he, he will get title to this through Indian deeds. Now, all of his deeds are lost in a fire. Um, but still, those three governments will accept his word. He's a very interesting character. He's well-connected. Um, John Winthrop knows him personally. William Bradford knows him personally, and he interacts directly with him. And this is very curious because um, back in England, um, he was a cobbler. Um, he wasn't a noble. He wasn't a businessman of note. Um, he, he was very much a commoner, but he was part of a group called the Dorchester Adventurers. And that is the group that was the inspiration behind uh, the Puritan, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the diaspora to the, uh, to the Massachusetts area. Now, this area on the North Shore, need, need to note this, this is held um, throughout this period uh, by um, Native Americans. Uh, up until the point that they sell these parcels. And um, it's interesting because as we trace these through Indian deeds, um, they have some very interesting um, uh, provisions within those deeds. They're quit rents. And these quit rents actually um, give title to the land, but it maintains rights of the original owners. And along the shore, um, we will find by the uh, 1660s, a new group of people coming in and people such as uh, Samuel York, um, James Thomas, a, a individual by the name of Williams. And um, in, it's sort of interesting the Pachepska papers uh, note uh, that he and his family are extinct. So I've never heard that associated with people, but, um, and then we'll have uh, James Giles, Thomas Giles. Um, we'll have um, Alexander Brown. We'll have Caldecott, Humphreys, Davies, all along this uh, shoreline up to uh, Swan Island. And these, these are all deeded through Indian deeds. 
Um, on the east shore here, we have uh, settlers who have secured a deed by 1639, um, John Brown and Bateman. Apologize for the delay, my computer seems to, come on. There we go. Okay, let's talk about those three, uh, three governments and, and particularly uh, we have Plymouth right here. We've talked about Plymouth, um, but um, Massachusetts Bay, um, the, the great migration starts in 1630. Um, they've done a little bit of exploratory work prior to that, but it really doesn't get established until 1630 and it grows very quickly. Um, and although we can say that the people of Plymouth who called themselves uh, the saints, they were known by other Puritan groups as the separatists. They were, um, have, had very devout and extreme views um, compared to the Puritans uh, that settled to the north of them. But there is generally a fairly good relationship between Bradford, the leader of Plymouth, and Winthrop, the leader of Massachusetts Bay. The problem is um, these two groups um, are somewhat different. And when we get an interaction of people from Massachusetts. Um, this is a group of uh, folks who are in an emerging merchant class and they're very clever and they're very aggressive. And um, they see what's going on in terms of uh, the value of trade and they wanna buy into it. So, we to go back, we had gorges looking for those mineral estates um, along the main shore and into the interior. And then we had Plymouth who was looking to establish trade in order to pay off a debt. And then we have these merchants from Boston. And this is a very tight group. Um, some of them have um, some noble connections, but um, it, it tends to be um, not the firstborn and the entitled to inherit um, uh, opportunity, um, but, but they still hold a, uh, I will say a weak title to, to nobility. Uh, there are others um, like Christopher Lawson, um, He's a cooper, he makes barrels. Um, there's Clark and Lake. Um, one is uh, sells fabric, the other's a tailor. Um, they're both members of the same um, militia unit in Boston. Uh, they attend the same church. So we, we, we find that this is a very close association. Now, remember the Plymouth, uh, uh, territory that was marked out. And um, here it is right here. What happens is one of these merchants, Christopher Lawson, will recognize, well, if Plymouth is here and the main training opportunities into that area are here and um, okay, here's the line right here. And just below that territory at the Cabasaconte, uh, the um, confluence of the Cabasaconte, if I buy these two pieces, then when the trading network, those trading opportunities uh, arise, folks are going to be um, going by my, my location. Um, either um, to the south going north or the north going south to trade at uh, Kushnock uh, in the middle of the, the, the Plymouth Holdings. So um, uh, he, he gets title to these 
in uh, 1653, actually. And um, so uh, folks in Plymouth aren't very happy, but there are other issues as well. Um, when these guys from Massachusetts are trading with the Indians, apparently what they're doing, um, at, at least from the documentation, the, the settlers around the Bay who are still trading individually with the Indians, um, note that there is a lot of liquor and alcohol involved in these trades. And not only is it disrupting the trades and the Indians are being damaged by this, they're not getting fair value. It's leading to um, outbreak of hostilities between the Indians. Um, what's interesting here is that in a short time, Christopher Lawson will sell out his holdings here to Clark and Lake. Here we are, this is Mary Meeting Bay down here and Clark and Lake are right over here. And he will become an agent for them. And again, uh, this practice continues. That results in an oath of allegiance in 1654 where the settlers who have established homesteads along the rivers and the bay's shores um, seek uh, help from Plymouth Plantation to hold people legally liable for damages in trade uh, with the Indians. Now, part of this may have been to protect their, their own interests, but they specifically um, note that alcohol among the Indian communities is becoming an issue. Ah, well, as time goes on, we're going to find the restoration of uh, the Stuart dynasty uh, in uh, 1660. Charles, the fir, uh, Charles II will assume the throne. And he has a problem. One of his problems is um, Massachusetts is somewhat, um, it's powerful. They have a very unique charter. Uh, that he does not have direct control. This, that is not a uh, colony where they received the grant directly um, from the crown. Um, they were given the opportunity to establish their own uh, government. Um, and he wants to bring them into control and compliance with the other colonies, um, but he doesn't want to alienate them. Um, so we have Massachusetts, we have Gorges, um, we have uh, Plymouth, all vying for control of the, uh, of the bay, regulating it, managing it, and Charles steps in. And Charles sends a, uh, a charter uh, a commission to take a look and tour the area. Uh, they don't think very much of the people of Maine. One of the quotes from one of the commissioners is uh, that the settlers in the Bay are mostly made up of fishermen and they trade their wives as they do their boats. Um, so not, not a very flattering uh, uh, picture of, of the people living around the bay. In the end, what will happen is um, Charles II will grant the gorgeous heirs the right to the land. And um, this was definitely the wrong choice because this family didn't have the influence, the power, uh, the structure or the finances to be able to regulate it. And it was never going back to becoming a manorial uh, collection of man manorial estates. So, um, you know, that, that leads to the chaos um, in, in the area that's taking place. Um, in addition to that, if we take a look at this map again, this is from the uh, Johnston 
1755 map, but it's uh, suitable for our use here. He divides the territory off, and this is the Kennebec, here's Merry Meeting Bay, and here's the Sagatahawk or the lower Kennebec. And he says, all of you who are living on the East shore are now part of a um, new political unit called Cornwall. And the center of that is Pemaquid, that is now called Jamestown. And this will be my gift to the Duke of York, my brother, James. Um, this is the infamous James II. Um, this is uh, eventually managed by folks from New York. Um, it's not a good match. It doesn't work out well. One interesting byline to this was there's another oath of allegiance where people around Mary Meeting Bay who are on the West Shore ask for liquor licenses. And these are some of the later settlers. And they are granted um, if they pledge oath, the oath of allegiance uh, to this uh, Cornwall uh, political unit, even though they live outside the boundaries. Um, so uh, those are the events. Um, this is King Philip Medicom. Um, though, you know, into this area, um, there are a lot of influences external for the people and for the in, uh, in indigenous population that, that really create confusion and uh, misrule. And um, it's interesting because when we take a look at the relationships between the settlers and the, and the indigenous people, we find that quite often there are clear cases of cooperation and um, goodwill and, um, and not just in trade, but um, in other matters as well. And I'm gonna stop there. So I'll pass it back to you, Bruce. Great. We've rehearsed this personally a couple of times. That was masterful. Sorry, it was just brilliant. Thank you. Back at you. And I had no, I had no idea how coherently you'd put this together. Uh, anyway, you, this this session started maybe focused a little too much on King Philip's War, but. Um, it, uh, King Philip's War was, was simply the end of the, the first episode of colonization. When we began the project, I thought that here was a, a blank slate to study a community that existed before King Philip's War. I thought, well, the Indians won the war. And I, I must say, I've noticed through my career, I think there are at least seven books published on King Philip's War. People are fascinated by it. Most of those books make no mention of Maine, interestingly. The books that do sometimes say it was a different war. It was definitely not a different war. The best account, first-hand account we have of uh, what happened in the Bay was by James Giles. The Giles family is particularly interesting to us because Thomas was the sire of James and uh, ultimately John Giles. Thomas Giles, I'll just take a slight diversion here to say he was lucky, he was in England, accepting an inheritance when the war broke out. He never came back to Mary Meeting Bay. He decided instead to move to Pemaquid, where he set up a, a new farm. And unfortunately then, and James was born at that time, about that time. Um, unfortunately, the next war was King William's War, when a lot of the indigenous people around here were actually active allies of the French. And this is a war between the English and the French. And uh, uh, Thomas was actually, escaped the first war, but was killed in the second. And his son, James, was captured, lived seven years among a group of Indians you know, on the St. John River. So he, he's a very interesting character in the second chapter. But uh, his older brother, James, gave us a brief account of what it was like when the war broke out. 
And what's interesting about it is that the local indigenous people weren't involved. In fact, between Merrimini Bay and the Penobscot River, some of them just said, we're getting out of here. You know, we have relationships with these people and we don't want to actually see our English friends killed. Now, I'm sure these are not unified communities. Uh, in fact, an important chief named Adak Wando, who didn't participate in the war, as far as we know, was visited by people trying to resolve the conflict. And he said, you know, we didn't participate, but you know, some of my young men might have. I, we can't control them. So the, the point is that uh, the indigenous people around Mary Meeting Bay had productive relationships with the uh, pioneers, as we call them. And, and as a matter of fact, after the war ended, there were probes for English people to resettle in the area. And around 17, 14, 15, and thereafter, the sons of the people who had originally sold these pieces of land to the English came back and said, yeah, yeah. My father sold this to you. So, you know, Indian geopolitics in this area is complex. And, uh, but get, to get back to my original point, the, um, our, my original assumption that the first settlers were wiped out and went away is, is not, turns out not to be accurate because uh, many uh, of the descendants of the first settlers came back to the Bajepska proprietors who reorganized the territory and tried to resettle it. And they, they tried to claim their parents, grandparents' land. And there's an interesting series of uh, documents of the Maine Historical Society in the Pajepska Papers, Collection 61, that deal with these issues. So the, my, my sense of the first period of colonization being totally disconnected from the second is not true. And in fact, these English colonists wanted to very badly to come back and to reclaim a foothold in this area. So um, the interesting story, the Indian story continues to be interesting into the future, but I, I know Fred uh, controls a PowerPoint set that deals with our actual archeological uh, excavations that provide some concrete evidence of the presence of these people. And so Fred, would you like to show that now? Sure. Uh, if I can get it going. Is that up? Uh, yeah. But let me just say that some of the stuff is available on our website. And it, more, much of it will be in the future. So, Is that displaying? No, we're not getting it. No, it's anything. not. Okay, let me go back to uh, share screen then. Um, there we go. Okay, yep. great. So that's in the mode where you need, yeah, if you go to the slideshow, you can maybe get it going there. Yeah. There we go. Oh, nice. Fred, narrate as we go along. <laughs> okay, this, this is an aerial view. The location is really interesting because this is early. It's very far from the shore and quite high. Um, and, and we think this location, um, this high and far, has something to do with that um, quest for view shed. Um, this was a, a, a very difficult site. Um, it, it, it was a mystery site. It required extensive work. Um, usually when you get to a site, um, you only want to do uh, an, a, enough of the area to get to answer the questions that you have. Um, with this, because of 350 years of plowing, um, it was just scattered. Horizontal integrity was completely lost. There was still some vertical integrity, um, but it required us to use a very different approach than um, you know, uh, one usually would in uh, excavating and, and also doing the analysis. Um, 
And um, we notice here that there are, this is a middle terrace here. There's an upper terrace here. We think there's a later farm here in 1718. Uh, and um, we, we use a lot of LIDAR. Um, that's one of our technologies. We've been blessed with that. And um, that shows the landscape. Um, you know, uh, in, in a site like this, um, in an open field, uh, that's a good thing, but um, you know, there's still a lot of record taking. Bruce referenced that um, uh, uh, archival document in collection 61 that mentioned in a series uh, sequence, uh, that was it. Um, and because of um, the loss of horizontal integrity, we had to do clustering. Um, this right here, which is sort of interesting, um, we took that as a pivot point. Um, there's a fireplace feature here. I can show that to you. It's right here. Um, we don't know what this is. This is just a lens. It may have been a desk or a, a table. This is a pit cellar. Um, I'm trying to keep up with the pace here. Um, fortunately, we were blessed with uh, the ability to have uh, some of our more significant artifacts um, curated. And, um, and that was done, that was a pre-treatment. The type of structure that was there was earth fast. Some may not be familiar with it. It required three frames and two chambers. One of those chambers would have been very narrow and housed the chimney. Um, and basically this is made out of wood, oak, and um, mud and straw. It sounds like the three little pigs house. Um, this is um, a replica at Pemaquid, and I'm not sure how many folks have been there. Interestingly enough, our structure is about this size. Um, the nails that we found, we believe that those were uh, basically used for sheathing, not in the, in the construction itself. It would have been mortise and tendon. Um, this is an excerpt from a deed um, to uh, Thomas Watkins from Durumkin, um, granting land um, as a thank you for escorting him from Boston to Albany. One of the things that um, we bumped up against was uh, prehistoric um, uh, material. Um, we didn't, we only uh, excavated um, the area of the colonial, but some of that still had the prehistoric uh, component there. So we had to make sure that we had done due diligence with uh, that part of the collection. Uh, but the rest of that area lay, uh, lies intact. So that's the short, quick trip around the site. If I can get it to stop. <laughs> you want this uh, whole slideshow to stop? Yeah. Can you do that, Martha? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Yep. So Bruce, do you want to recap? Oh boy, recap, a complex project. Um, I guess I'll take it from a personal view. Sorry for it, I told you I would narrate that slide series. Um, I've worked in Maine for a long time had a family association with Maine for a long time. I found that um, people have kind of folkloric understandings of what went on here. Some of them are pretty accurate. And the way people had, the, the kind of access people had to information when I came here um, for a long time was pretty fragmentary. But I have to say that uh, We've discovered how to dig into archival materials. We've developed archaeological techniques. We've found ways to not just write books, but to communicate with people, especially with the help of organizations like the Mary Meeting Bay Trust. 
uh, and our the whole ultimate goal of this project has been to reconnect people who live here now with their past. Uh, this is not a trivial exercise. We're going through some times now where some people would like to disconnect us with our past for various political reasons. Um, but those are false promises. We really have to understand who we are and uh, the forces that shaped our communities. And if we don't understand them, we're gonna misunderstand the opportunities for the future. I can remember, for example, the Androscoggin River in 1972 when I moved here. Uh, it was a disaster. And now it's a beautiful river. Uh, understanding of indigenous people when I came here, one tribe at a time, uh, not true. Um, Indians against settlers, not true. Um, much more complexity, much more interesting. These are all human people dealing with the conditions in which they lived. And I think we can all learn a great deal from the kinds of things we're doing. We're not the only ones who did it. We didn't start the exploration of colonial uh, settlement of this area, but with the help of the Mary Meeting Bay Trust, I think we've been able to carry it forward. So I'm really happy that we, uh, us old guys, took this project on as a, as a research project. So uh, I must say, a brilliant presentation. But now I, I wonder if any people have questions about. So yeah. So Bruce, th thank you, thank you, and Fred very much. This is Ed, and um, and I, I just yeah, really thank you both so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I do want to say that I neglected in introducing you the obvious that you for years were chief archaeologist at the Maine State Museum and also a lecturer at Bates. So um, if I'll just kick off a question with, with what's next for the project here. Well, I'll take that on, I guess. Uh, we chose Mary Reading Bay because there seemed to be a, um, a need. Let's try that again. Well, uh, what's in the future? The future is that uh, Mary Mead Bay was a hub in the sense that it was connected to all kinds of other places, but the most important concentration of early colonialism, English, uh, was uh, on the, 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 the Kennebec from Swan Island down and mainly down on the Saginaw in the area of Bath Woolwich. And those sites have also not been discovered and those people's lives have also not been explored in the way we've explored ours. And we have in particular, a new technology, a digital archive, which allows us to tabulate uh, the lives of those people as they are mentioned in historic records and then to coordinate, uh, not to coordinate, but to, to uh, interconnect them, to trace uh, networks of interaction uh, between the settlers and between them and the uh, indigenous population. So we want to expand geographically into the Kennebec Saginaw corridor and to uh, expand this uh, database project, which allows us to find out wonderful things. I mean, these aren't just individuals who arrived and they didn't arrive a boatload at a time like the Pilgrims and the Puritans. They arrived for various reasons at various times but they had to stay alive in an area with no government, no governance uh, among Indians whose lives had also been turned upside down. So we have great hope that we can find support to expand our archeological excavation, explorations into the uh, Kennebec Saginaw corridor and also to expand our uh, digital uh, explorations about uh, who these people were, where they appeared in the historical record and what their interconnections may have been. One from Nina or Nina Mendel saying, would the recipient of a grant actually go and live on the plot? Uh, Nina, uh, very seldom for, for the number of grants that were issued, um, very, very few. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of the uh, uh, plans were uh, sincere. However, the turmoil back in England 
um, during the Stuart dynasty. Uh, you can make great plans, but um, you know, carrying that feudal system over to the new world uh, probably wasn't going to meet with success anyways. Uh, it, it's a totally different setting. And uh, it, it, it was difficult because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the controversy surrounding um, each of the Stuart uh, kings. So almost never. Here's a question from George. Did Fort Western enter into your period of investigation? If so, how? And living in Rockland, I'm curious about the overland connection eastward from Fort Western to Duck Trap Harbor. Bruce, do you wanna? You need to unmute, Bruce. Let me take a stab at some of that. Fort Western was established. It was a series of Indian wars, beginning with King Philip's War, which was simply a, an indigenous uprising. I think basically inspired by the lieutenants of King Philip when he was killed. Uh, James Giles' account of his having to leave his home uh, says that basically most of the inc inciters came from Massachusetts, King Philip's followers, and they got some, some support from Indians on the Canada, probably from Norwich but that, uh, that was the first of a series of wars. The, the, the next wars tended to be the result of conflicts between the crowns of England and France. And uh, um, Fort Western was built to protect New England from attacks from Quebec. And it was a staging house, the actual pointy end of the defense was Fort Halifax in what's now Winslow. And that was built in 1754. And so it was actually the bookend of the last Indian Wars. The King Philip's War that which wiped out the pioneers in Mermaiding Bay was, was the first of conflicts. And the uh, French and Indian War so-called was the last and, and Fort Western was built for that purpose. Now, it's not unconnected by any means to our ultimate goals, which is to connect all, you know, with, with our digital archive abilities, we wanna connect the whole stories. These people didn't arrive by the boat load and they all had interests, family interests. They came, they were treated, they came back. Same with the indigenous people. They went to Quebec, they came back when they could, they went back to Quebec. This is a tension zone. It was the Eastern frontier of English settlement in North America. Very interesting. So it, it's not out of our scope of interest. It's just beyond what we handle in this first phase. And I'd love to continue the project and expand it to this whole region because I think we learned a lot from it. And Fort Weston, by the way, is a wonderful facility. It's just the oldest standing log fort in North America. Very worth uh, your support and interest. So, no, not directly, but hopefully in the future. Okay, one more question. Um, two more questions. Uh, the first one Kevin entered in the chat. Thank you. Did the people living around Mary Meaning Bay in the early 17th century leave the area only to attempt to reclaim their holdings later? Were they forced to leave? And if not, why did they leave? And we'll have one more question after this and we close. Um, if, if, if you don't mind, uh, Kevin, I'd just like to read something. This is from uh, James Giles, one of those settlers with an Indian deed on the north shore of the bay. Um, and he writes um, a narrative. Um, and <clears throat> he says, about June 1675 and in August, the Indians rose at the eastward and forced us to forsake our house and go to Samuel York's house to garrison, where we stayed about a month. But the Indians, growing too strong for us, killed our cattle and swine and plundered our houses. And having killed several people in Casco Bay, 
several of our men grew faint-hearted and left us. So as we had but nine men left in the garrison and too weak to withstand so great a power of Indians, if they should set upon us. About the middle of September, we were forced to forsake our garrison and go down to Rousick House, to the main garrison, where we stayed about six weeks, in which time we had some skirmishes with the Indians. Um, Rousick House is Clark and Lake which later gets destroyed. Um, do they come back? Uh, do they claim the territory? Yes. Those that have good title, and that's a great question because there are people living on this frontier that we don't know about. There are tenants, uh, there are squatters, there are servants. Um, in, in one case, we know that there was a slave. Um, there, there are extended family members. So there will, um, the people who have good title um, will be coming back to reclaim either, either they or their heirs will be coming back to claim um, uh, th the land that they settled on. Um, but there are many more people here, um, uh, an unnamed population. Last question, John Coombs, any plans on researching and conducting digs on the western shore of the New Meadows River? Bruce? John Coombs? Interesting. <laughs> well, look, <laughs> one of the uh, mysterious people of the, pre, of the pioneer period is uh, Alistair Coombs. And the Coombs family knows something about Alistair and they speculated something about them. And I think he's a perfect example of someone who came here. He may have had a, he may have had a deed because a lot of deeds weren't registered. Some of them were lost. Uh, we don't know that he has a deed from the Indians. It would have been from the Indians. Um, but we know that he had a line, which was referred to in a second deed, which kind of implies that he may have had a deed. Uh, and we don't know his fate. We think he may have died in, in Philip's War, but we know that the Coombs came back. So the Coombs are well known to us. Now the Western Shore, ah, boy. The Western Shore, the, 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 the Brunswick side of, of Mary Meaning Bay has terrible soils. So we have to wonder why haven't people settled there? There's an interesting feature that we know about from deeds and maps called the Stevens Carry Place. And it connects upper reaches of Casco Bay, which is New Meadows, the upper upper tip of Casco Bay, to Meribane Bay. And rather than trying to navigate that, uh, apparently people established a carry. They could load or unload on Mary Ming, uh, on, on uh, at, at New Meadows and carry or bring things from uh, Mary Meaning Bay. And the Coombs play a critical role in that. We're not, but they're, they're, archaeologically, these sites are hard to find. Archivally, the lives of these people are hard to trace. Um, all I can say is we've got a pretty firm handle on the historic and some archaeological data on the top some side of Mary Meaning Bay. Uh, the Brunswick side, not so much. But these are all unconnected, interconnected with people all the way down to Harpswell. We'd love to continue to explore that because they all knew each other, they all interacted. And uh, it's a complex picture. Ed, okay, uh, I think we're we'll wrap, yeah, yeah. Wrap, wrap it up. Um, uh, I'll give a, a shout out to Alan Bowes, who I think was in your video slide as your as your LIDAR guy. I think he was running a drone there, maybe, right? Um, and uh, thank you all again for making this possible and hope to see folks back in, uh, in January, January 12th, uh, and hear about uh, Central Maine Power and, and what they're doing at the Bay now. So the latest attack on the Bay, okay? So thank you all. Thank you. Good night.